Since Pentecost Sunday, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit, and we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit, gifts of the Spirit, and what's the opposite of that? It's the, the work of the flesh and the work of the world. And we know right now, just because of, of where the world is headed, we need the church to shine brighter. Amen? We need, we need to operate in the gifts that God has given us for his glory, but also for the benefit of the church and those who need Jesus. Last week I talked about the, the gift of prophecy. Today I want to talk about the spiritual gift of healing. And I, I, just, I hope that this is edifying for you that you will maybe learn something. But I, I do want to ask Holy Spirit to be just so present today in the message with you sitting in the seat. Something that I think is really easy is that it's easy for us to sit out amongst other believers and just not feel very significant or to see other people as possessing such great things and maybe... Introverts are looking at extroverts and saying, well, I could never do that. Well, I'm here to tell you that you, you can. God will empower whoever he wants to empower. Amen? He will do through you whatever he wants to do through you. Amen? And can we just understand that as we sit here today? That some of you, you have gifts that have been untapped, un seen, maybe unrealized even. But I want to talk about the spiritual gift of healing and what is that? The, the word for healing, or the or, or word that is used most often or quite often is iaomai, and, and that means to heal. And by definition, it means to draw attention to the Lord. It means to make whole, and most oftentimes it's a physical, but sometimes it's a, it's a spiritual or emotional or mental type of healing. We can be healed of anything. And I just want to start off by saying this. Can, can you and I, can any of us pray over somebody anytime? Or ask God for, for ourselves, somebody that we know, even somebody that we're present with or somebody that we're not, and, and ask him to heal them? Can we pray for that? Of course we can. Do you need the spiritual gift of healing to do that? No, you don't. Because I can tell you, I, I don't believe that I possess the spiritual gift of healing, but I do possess a desire that people would be healed. I have personally prayed for people just as a believer and have seen people be set free from things. And I know that many of you have as well. And I want to I come back to that here in just a bit. But can some receive the supernatural gift of healing, which is different than what I just talked about? The answer is yes. And here's what I want to say, that there might be some or several who are in this room right now who have that gift. You might not even know it. There might be somebody here who suspects it. You might have thought, hmm, I wonder, and you just don't know what to do with it? There may be some who have the gift and just sit quietly with it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we give you thanks. We're so compelled to praise you and to thank you for who you are, what you do. Father, we ask you to be present. Holy Spirit, we ask you to be present in this room right now, in our lives right now. God, we ask that, that you would prompt, that you would push, that you would reveal to those who are sitting out here in front of me and to myself, to all who are in this place, to all who might be listening later, that you would reveal what it is that you have given them, what you have for them, what you've asked of them. Lord, that we would press into that and that we would see these gifts be realized, that we would use them for your glory. But we just ask you, Lord, that you would steer this meeting today to your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. 
How many of you in the room right now, just with, with a show of hands, and you don't have to ever raise your hand if I ask you to raise your hand, but, but I believe it, it's, it's good. But how many of you in the room right now, you are in need of some sort of healing? And don't be, don't be shy. If, if you are in need of healing, it could be in your being, it could be physical, it could be mental, it could be emotional. Isaiah 40, 29 says, He gives power to the weak, power to the powerless, and to those who have no might, He increases strength. That's our God. That's what He does. And it's real. How about, how about those of you, and you can, you don't, again, you don't need to raise your hand, but maybe you want to, but how many of you need a, a healing? Is it something socially or relationally? You need a healing. And I know there are a lot of people who actually do. Between people, it's, you, you have a, a broken relationship somewhere that needs to be healed. I think there are a lot of those. In Psalm 147, verse 3, it says, And he heals the brokenhearted, and he binds up their wounds. In Psalm 30, verse 2, it says, O Lord, and Yahweh, my God, I cried out to you, and you healed me. And I know that I have many times, I have in my quiet, private time, and maybe a lot of you too, have cried out to God and say, God, I need healing. In relationship, physically, however it is that we cry out. And the reason why I'm asking these questions right now is because I just want to bring it forward so that you are thinking that something is stirring in you because I'm going to come back to it in just a little bit. But what is the spiritual gift of healing? What is that? It's when the Holy Spirit heals someone from a disease or infirmity supernaturally through the prayer or the touch of someone gifted with healing. That's the spiritual gift of healing. It's also the restoring of health and well-being through the direct intervention of God. God is the gift giver. It is God's power that is behind it, behind the healing. And sometimes the gifts, when we see these gifts, they kind of interwork with one another. So I believe with the gift of healing, a gift of faith is also working. A gift of knowledge, a gift of wisdom is also working. So it can start as a, a word of knowledge that leads then to, uh, to a question to someone that you might not even know. And you might go up to them and say, I believe the Lord is, is saying to me, do you, do you have this? And you can ask that question, and, and a person might respond, yes, I do. Well, you've been given a word of knowledge, and, and that is something that I, I believe you should pray for that person. Or it can be more obvious where this person has a, a, a limp, and, and you're, you're, you're watching somebody limp, and you don't go up to that person and say, do you have a limp? You know they have a limp. But you can ask them their name, you can, you can whatever, but you can ask to pray for that person and then pray for them. I testified a few weeks ago or a while back, uh, Russell Wood, Russell was here, he, he preached for us one Sunday and, and I said this when he was here, but for those of you who missed it and I think it's, it's relevant, uh, I was with Todd actually, Todd was standing right next to me. We were about to go out and, and make 10,000 hamburgers for a neighborhood somewhere. I don't remember where we were going that night, but I had not met Russell, but I had heard about Russell. Todd was saying, tonight you're going to meet Russell. And so Russell walks right up to me. I was not even introduced yet. And he said, hey, brother, you got a pain in your knee? Right there. He even pointed to the right knee. And I said, I do. He said, you mind if I pray for you? Still haven't been introduced to him yet. And he bends down and he prays for my knee. And I, and I testify, of this is about four years ago, would you think? I, I don't have pain in that knee still today, okay? So I'm telling you, Russell knew, he came and he prayed, and I believe that I experienced healing in my knee. It had been constant before that. Terry Bartz was a guy that we had met, Christy and I were on a walk up the East Coast, and some of you have heard 
stories from time to time about this, but we were in Moorhead City, North Carolina. It's uh, one of the, or if not the most southernmost city in North Carolina. And we were there, and we had met this, we were 29 at the time, 20, yeah, something like that, 28 at the time. And he was 50, 50 years old, and he was a youth pastor at this, at this church. And he was telling us about being on a missions trip and how he had been talking to the kids about praying. They went to a third world country, and he was talking to his kids about praying, a prayer of faith over someone. And these kids gathered around some, a, a, a man, and he t- was telling this story. They gathered around a man who was sitting there, and he had a withered hand. And all of his kids in faith gathered around him, and he, he said this, even to his own shame, he stood off watching his kids pray, trying to go through his mind, figuring out what to tell them when it didn't work. And he said, I kid you not, I watched it happen. This man's withered hand grew back to a normal hand, right there. And you know what? I believe his testimony. I believe his testimony, what he said there. In James 5.15, it talks about a powerful prayer of faith that will save. And the word there for save is, is the word sozo. And it means to heal, to restore, or to rescue. And it says to, to heal, restore, rescue the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he has committed sins, that they shall be forgiven him. God has power. And he wants us to use it. Jesus told the disciples in Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, he said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, and drive out demons. Freely you have received and freely give. So what's the purpose of healing? What's the purpose of healing? Is it only for the comfort and the physical restoration of the person being healed? Is that the only reason that we receive healing? I don't believe so. I, I believe it's more than that. That's certainly an incredible part, but here's, here's one thing that I see, and maybe those of you who have ministered this way, you've seen this too, but healing brings hope in place of hopelessness. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Healing brings hope in place of hopelessness. So true. And what is the hope? The Bible tells us that that hope is Jesus. The hope is Jesus. Healing always points to Jesus. So I have a question. So what if God doesn't heal? What if the healing hands or the prayer of healing, quote unquote, doesn't work? What if I remain in my suffering? What then? Because I think that always has to be part of the conversation. We have to address it because when we talk about healers and healing, we don't always talk about the other side of the coin, and we have to, because it exists, because it's real, because we will all experience this somehow, somewhere. But what if I'm left in my suffering? What if I'm left unhealed? Has God abandoned me? No. Do you know that I, I, I have things in me that have been left unhealed? There are things in me that have been healed. I broke my back on February 12th, 1990. And through a process, a, a very fast process, God, through people praying and, and laying hands on me, I'm healed. I've talked about this before. But I've also talked about, I've been deaf. I had hearing when I was born. I could hear in both ears. But somewhere in my preteens, I don't remember the day, but I did realize, hey, mom, I can't hear out of my right ear. How do you know? Well, I used to be able to stand somewhere when the trains were still running through Wyoming and Forest Lake. I used to be able to tell what direction the train was coming from, and then there was a day I couldn't tell anymore. I didn't know what direction the train was coming, and so I covered both of my ears, and I realized there is nothing happening right here. I, I went deaf somewhere in my preteens in my right ear. I have been prayed over many, many times to receive my hearing back, but I haven't. But something that I have found with both of these is praise and contentment. 
because God gets the glory for me not being able to hear but still being able to sing. You see what I'm saying? So it's all about Jesus. It's about God. It's about what brings him glory. But what if I'm left in my suffering? What if you are? What if someone else is? Should we remain in hopelessness? What's the answer? No, there's no need at all to remain in hopelessness. Because even in suffering, and, and I'm going to show you this, even in suffering, there's a pathway to hope and quite likely whatever healing God intends you to have. So in a sense, I'm deaf in my right ear, but I don't really ever complain about it. Do you know who complains about my deafness more than anything? My family. <laughs> you know why? Because it's like this. I already told you that. <laughs> Can't you hear? <laughs> what are you, deaf? <laughs> well, just throw that out there, you know. But do I need to be hopeless? It's great for sleeping. God be the glory. <laughs> it's awesome. I don't know what it's like to watch a big screen movie in stereo, though, and that would be cool. And when sometimes I've been in a theater, I've said, Lord, just for a little while. <laughs> but listen to this. In suffering, there is a pathway to hope. And I believe that every believer, and especially those with healing hands, have to communicate that. That even in suffering is a pathway to hope. Romans 5, 1 through 5, and I will say this from time to time throughout the, the year, but it says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know Suffering produces. It means right there that word produces. It means it works out. It works out perseverance. Perseverance works out character. And character, which is experience in our life, it's a proof, it's a trial that has created this thing. Character works out hope. And hope does not put us to shame. And some translations say it does not disappoint us. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So like I said, I'm a strong believer that anyone with the gift of healing or who counsels another in the faith needs to have these two things. Needs to have faith that God empowers to heal and heals. And then the second thing is the understanding that God allows suffering. He does. Is there anybody here that could deny that God allows suffering? He does. How many of you have suffered in any way, at any time? You suffer. Now let me ask you this. Have you grown through the suffering? Do you know what the refiner's fire is? It burns out the purity. So if you could think of silver as needing a healing because it's full of impurity, it goes into the fire, burns out the dross, comes out pure. Don't we do that? Doesn't he say we do that? Isn't that a type of healing too? Lord, heal us. How about as parents? I see a lot of parents out there. As parents, we know what it means to allow and withhold at the same time, right? You know. Your kids don't like it. But we know what that means. And why should our father be any different? Trials, suffering, that can bring about a greater result and a healing. And sometimes a healing is instant. Sometimes it's a journey. I've been on both, and I know some of you have been on both. How many of you know who Johnny Erickson Tata is? If you're probably older, you know who she is. So everybody who just raised your hand, oh, I'm older. <laughs> you're older. How many kids look around? How many kids raise their hand when I said that? <laughs> Johnny Erickson Tata, what's, what's her situation? She's a quadriplegic, right? 
She's an artist. She's a speaker. I'm going to quote something that was uh, from, a, I think, on a radio program, Grace to You, 45 years after the accident that left her paralyzed, 45 years, God has still not healed Johnny Erickson Tata. Her perspective is one of great faith that God may remove your suffering, and that will be great, a great cause for praise, but if not, he will use it. He will use anything and everything that stands in the way of his fellowship with you, so let God mold you and make you, transform you from glory to glory, and that's the deeper healing. And I know people who are going to stay in their suffering. I'll tell you something. You have to look for where the healing is. The healing might be peace. It might be contentment. What is God doing in you? But I want to say that I'm less interested these days in seeing or chasing after superstar gifted Christians. I'm more interested to see you, the local body, exercising the gifts in community. Because more and more as I stand here and more and more as I read, more and more as I'm digging into all of the things of the Holy Spirit and the gifts, the more I realize that, uh, that, that we have gotten away from the local body and we're all gravitating toward these things out here. Yeah. What if we paid attention to what's going on right here? Right here. Humility and love is something that we need to see. 1 Corinthians 13, I read the whole thing last week. If we're seeking to heal others in order to draw attention to ourselves, we're outside the boundaries of humility. We need to be humble to exercise any of these gifts. And we need to remember that with all the gifts, healing included, that they were given to edify and strengthen the church and draw people to Jesus. And that's it. Not more than that. Is the gifted healer at the center of healing? The answer is no. Is the one being healed at the center of healing? You might think so, but the answer is no. Jesus is at the center of healing. And that's another thing. It's, this is what my, my push and my, my call to the church right now is put Jesus back in the middle for everything. Put Jesus back in the middle. Here's the thing. Jesus is salvation. His name is salvation. Yeshua means salvation. Salvation is at the center. So what's the source of healing? Is it my hands or your hands? Is that the source of the healing? No. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, 5, it says, By his wounds we are healed. So what's the source of the healing? This is why we have to come back to the cross. We come back to the Savior. The Savior is at the center. When we put a, a touch on somebody or pray over somebody and they're healed, hallelujah. If they're not, hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Savior is at the center. We always keep the Savior at the center. Healing is being made whole, and by his wounds we're made whole. Jesus' healing ministry was a sign of his Messiahship. So how much of Jesus' healing aimed at the power to save? If you read through the gospel, when he healed, what, did, what was he aiming at? Salvation. Why was he doing it? To draw attention to the fact that God wants to save, and he is bringing credit to himself, saying that, here, I'll show you. Let me show you. What should the church be doing right now? Showing and pointing back to him. That is what it's all about. I hope you can say amen to that. Our greatest healing is being healed from what? Sin. The effects and the benefit of that healing is salvation. So when we heal or ask for healing in Jesus' name, we put Jesus at the center and we proclaim him as Messiah who heals, Messiah who saves. And when Jesus empowers others, to heal in his name, it points to the power of God. And what that is is cause for testimony. If you've been healed, testify. In fact, in just a minute, we're going to. 
But the gifted healer always points to God. The healer and the healed should always testify. In fact, that should be for any believer, any witness at all, we should testify and point to him. What I'm going to do in just a second is I'm going to come down there with the microphone. And I want you to be thinking about, and these are just going to be 60-second testimonies. No, you know, I mean, we're going to have to just keep it really short. But God is powerful, and he has done some powerful things in your lives, in ministries that you have been a part of or that you have done. Maybe somebody has been gloriously been saved in your, in your presence or healed in some way. Something has happened in them. We're going to come around. We're going to testify about those things, and then we're going to do another thing right after that. But I want us to be reminded, God heals whom he chooses to heal. God gives power to whoever he chooses. God gives the gifts to whoever he chooses. And God gets the glory always. If we can keep these things in mind and always keep the Savior at the center, we will do well with our gifts. Now I'm going to say one more time, I really believe that there are some, some of you who are sitting out there who may have a gift of healing. You may have this gift. Some of you are might, you might be scared to death and think, I don't, I don't want this. I don't, I don't want the attention. The reason I'm saying everything I'm saying is because you don't have to worry about the attention because the attention is on him. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes. So do you understand why I'm, I'm trying to frame this up for you so that you understand that if you find that you have healing hands, it doesn't mean you're going to have a book deal tomorrow. Okay? It means you have a responsibility similar to the prophet or the apostle or the teacher or the administrator, the leader, the person with the gift of helps. It's all working together. And I hope you see that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come down right now. If you've been healed of something, I want you to be bold right now. I don't want you to explain the whole life story and take a lot of, I want you to just say, I've been healed, this is what I was healed from, maybe when, okay? But raise your hand if you've been healed from something. Because there could be a lot. Charlie, great to recovering addict, alcoholic, and full gospel Christian. Keep it really simple. Several years ago, I went through treatment. I have 44 years of sobriety now. I'm not tooting my own horn. I'm just sharing my story and short. When I was in when I was in treatment, Michael Landon was the keynote speaker. If you don't know, he's a little house on the prairie, Joe. He is a recovering addict, alcoholic, and one of the things he shared was he said, gentlemen, supposedly marijuana is not considered a physically addicting drug. He said, only psychological, I don't buy it, but he said, even if it's true, let me share this with you. We that are alcoholics or chemically dependent people, we cannot share that stuff because he said, we don't know a darn thing about moderation. If a slice of pie is good, the whole pie is better. Bottom line, what happened is this. I was out of treatment, and I called a buddy of mine that was going through some really tough stuff. And I said, Dave, can I bump a couple joints from you? He said, I thought you went through treatment. I said, I did, but it's not. supposedly marijuana is not physically addicting. So I bummed a couple joints, and before long, I was drinking a beer, and I was back right where I started. And I remember this. My old counselor, when I left Hazelden, pulled me aside. We used to know each vaguely. I didn't know he was a CD counselor. We used to fish on the same lake, but he said, Charlie, I want to share something with you. Very briefly, he said, just say, if you're ever in a crisis and you don't know what to do, just say, God, if there is a God, help me, I need help. I said that that night because I was going to commit suicide. I was so mad at myself. And I was going to jump in the car and drive out in the country and get the gun out of the trunk. It was during a hunting season commit suicide. But I, I remember when I went back to get the gun out of the trunk, I remembered that prayer. 
God, if there is a God, help me, I need help. All of a sudden, this incredible peace and calmness came over me. I had to be around people. I drove into this little town in Lindstrom, Minnesota. There was a big Catholic church on the corner. That's the last place I wanted to go. But I had to be around people, so I ran in. There was nobody in church. I was leaving, and I thought I heard talking downstairs. Went down the basement steps, walked up to this room, cracked the door open, looked in. There's about 15 people in there. Guess what I walked into? AA meeting. Now that's called GMC, not General Motors Corporation. God made coincidence. And I've changed and I've never shared. I love my Lord and Savior. Thank you. Amen. Amen. A journey of healing from addiction. How many of you had a journey of healing from addiction? There's a whole bunch. That's awesome. God is good. Who else has a really quick healing story? I've got... Just understand, we've got a few minutes left, so not, no full testimonies, just a, a quick, who was it that raised your hand? Did you? Okay, the first one is a, a mental healing. For years, I had problems with uh, jealousy, and it caused a lot of problems in my marriage. And Jody and I were involved in a, uh, a small group with a different church, and uh, during one of the meetings, uh, I shared my problems with jealousy. And these people prayed over me. And I'm not sure how many days it was after they prayed that in the night I had a dream that I was up in the tree and the tree was cut and I was left up above. And I believe that the leaves are for the healing of the nations, but it's also represented healing of me. And uh, since then, uh, which has probably been about eight years, uh, even if I try to be jealous, it's very hard to be. The other thing, real quick, is my dad, for years, who never talked to me ever about the Lord. And one night, six months before he died, I came over to his and mom's house, and he was sitting at the table. And he said, Neil. It had to be a miracle. It had to be the Lord. I said, what? He said, my ear. I had a horrible earache, and all of a sudden, it was gone. Amen. Amen. Who else? I was told by doctors that I would never be able to have babies, and we were married. Oh yeah. Nine, that's right. Praise God. And so nine years we were married. The month that we conceived, there was, it was no coincidence. The Lord did something supernatural in my heart. The expectancy, um, there's a whole story with it, but we were just standing on the promises of God's word. God led us in very specific ways that month. And that's when I had my first baby, Destiny Promise. And uh, then three more. So glory to God. He's faithful. That's why, uh, that's why she has that name. That's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Chuck. Yeah, a lot of you know that I have epilepsy. Some of you might not know. But 40 years ago, I was healed from death. I should have died on that beach that day. Um, and there were people playing around me. And they had told me many, many times that had things not gone exactly, I mean, exactly as they did, I would not be sitting here. Um, and the things that God has done... Uh, from that day till now, taking a legally blind guy because I have vision issues to a professional photographer. Um, and it, I just want my word to reflect it back to him. And uh, so I, it, that's on my mind every single day. I should not even be sitting here with a beautiful wife and, and kids. So. Amen. So, so an example right here with Chuck. Uh, I've known Chuck a long, long time. With like my hearing... My deafness brings God glory, right? Well, Chuck would love to be able to see 2020 and, and uh, get rid of these glasses. And, and, and Chuck, you're not able to drive. There are a lot of limitations that you have, but what God has given him is the ability to bring him glory because of what he has. Amen? And so I just think that that's incredibly important. Yeah, I, I've never told uh, hardly anybody about this, but back in the 
between towards the end of 2007, 2008, after I left for Zion's sake, that group I was in, I was in an area where I was just so despondent about things in my life. I started drinking very heavily. I'd never done that before like that ever. And it just was getting so bad because I was drinking just to get totally out. And uh, I went through this, huh? Yeah, I went through this top period of time where I was uh, one weekend, uh, three or four days, I totally lost track of, e it was like either a Friday or Saturday or something. When I started coming out, because I ran out of vodka, a uh, friend of mine that was from, for, for Zion's sake, took me out to the VA hospital to, to get detox. And um, the people that were, I was, the house where I was living, they are Christians, but they were praying for me, and they felt very strongly in this group that there was a spirit of death hanging over me. And they prayed for the, the deliverance from that, and I think God healed me from that because after that, even just to think about drinking, it just made me nauseous. And to this day, I can't stand this. Man. Amen. Who else? Just another quick one. A couple quick. You just gave me, you gave me a microphone. That's dangerous. Um, no, <laughs> um, I'll make it as quick as possible. But I was youth pastoring, uh, and I was at at youth camp, um, and. Anyone that's pastored knows youth camp is about the kids. Um, and I had a, I had torn my meniscus with a major hyperextension um, and playing with kids is, <laughs> you know, difficult. But um, I was, you know, praying over my youth students and everything else. And nothing was about me uh, that evening. And um, all of a sudden, like, I had four friends just come up and like, dude, we've been looking for you for 45 minutes. We really feel we need to pray. And I just... I remember, so I'm like, all right, fine, let's pray. And it's like at the end, so they got worship, and there's people all over. It's loud uh, at Lake Geneva, if you've been there. Um, and they had, like, I remember everything just, they're praying, and I wasn't listening to anything anyone's saying. I'm just, um, I guess, like, everything got quiet almost in my head. And it was just, it was the softest conversation um, I've ever, most intimate conversation I've ever had with God, and it was so simple. And it was kind of what you said, you know, about the youth pastor with the hand. He was like, what am I supposed to, how am I supposed to handle this when, he, when the healing doesn't happen? And all God said was, do you actually believe that I can heal you? And it was like that, it healed my heart more than my knee. But as I, you know, broke down then, to like, man, well, that's challenging. <laughs> um, and I did, and I allowed it, and it just, then the, the test was like, all right, I guess now I, like, what next? And as I started walking, it just... Everything is fine. I've had no issues with my knee ever since. So, so, so some of what you're talking about is, is being healed of hopelessness. And so I have a question. How many of you in your life at one time or another, you had an extreme hopelessness? Look around. Look around. And, and then did something happen? Prayer a touch, encouragement from somebody, and your hopelessness was healed. Because I can tell you something, that, that one of the biggest healings just in my life is the healing of hopelessness. Because when we have hope, we can minister. When we have hope, we can move. We pull out a depression maybe, whatever it is. But I think a lot of healing that needs to, to happen, especially in the church, is the healing from hopelessness. How can we minister? How can we minister with no hope? Amen. Next thing that I want to do. The next thing I want to do. I, this little cutie right here. <laughs> She's like, anybody need anything? I got it. I got it right here. <laughs> That's so awesome. Isn't it great having kids in church? Huh? We'll just watch her and learn something right now, right? Let's just learn something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I have to move on. Uh, if you have other testimonies of healing, please share them because we need to hear those testimonies because those testimonies give us hope, okay? The next thing that I want to just bring forward, and I'm going to do this at some risk because in the last two weeks, I have seen not with great definition and clarity, 
but I have seen something in asking this question, and this puts the Lord totally in the driver's seat, which we want him to be in our services anyway, right? Is there anybody in the, in the room, in the service right now, that you have felt in this again, why I said what I said is because this is not you saying, oh, look at me. This is humility. And you're saying, I believe that I, I may have a gift of healing. Because it's easy to call out, anybody have a gift of prophecy? Does anybody have a gift of teaching? Does anybody have all of these other gifts, administration and all of these things? But this one I think is harder to draw out, which is why I felt really compelled to have this message today. Do you, is there anybody, as the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now, have you felt inclined? Are you thinking, man, I need to look at this or explore this, that you have a gift of healing? I want you to think about that. She's just ministering to you, Neil, right there. Do you have a gift of healing? Because if you do, I want to encourage you to use it. If you do, I believe that we need to have a touch. Because I think that the people who we have ministering at the end of services, to have somebody who believes they have a gift of healing, being able to pray over people, I think is incredibly important. She's just making her way. Oh my goodness, you are so cute. She's trying to give that away, and nobody is taking it. No, nobody, nobody wants it. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we just ask you right now that you would be glorified. We ask you right now that you would draw the gifts out of us. Lord, we ask you right now that your church would become powerful in humility in this place, in this city, in this neighborhood, where we are right now. Father, that the church has the ability to act on what you've already given. And see, I believe that in this body right now, there are some who have this gift, who've been given this gift, and maybe you're afraid to use it. Maybe you're afraid to, to stand out. Maybe you're afraid to fail because you're thinking, well, my, my hands didn't do the thing that I thought they were going to do. I'll tell you what, it's not about your hands. It's about Jesus. The Savior is in the center. Always. So I'm just going to be bold. Is there anybody sitting here today? You believe that you have a gift of healing. Would you stand? Would you just stand? God be the glory. God be the glory. Anybody else? That you have an inkling, that you've thought about it, you thought, God, could it be? Do I have this gift of healing? And, and you're doing this in humility. You're standing in humility right now, I know. It's not to stand out, it's just to stand up and say, I, I believe I have this, or I've had the inkling Remember that word somebody asked me over 30 years ago, if you even have an inkling to do this, would you do it? And I had the inkling. And you know what God does with inklings? Do you know what God does with weaklings? Do you know what God does and wants to do with his church? Friends, I believe that a revival's coming. Do you believe it? God, I just sense your presence here. To draw out from your church those you've gifted and those you've called. Those of you who are standing, would you do another thing? Would you come up front? This little one, she wants to play with you. Come on up, come on up. Come on.
Thank you, Jesus. Do you have reason to praise him right now, today? Church, these are your gifted healers, quite possibly, amen? The ones gifted, and maybe some of you are like, ah, I don't know. There might be more. Is anybody else? You've had the inkling. You feel it. You've sensed it. Somebody's told you. You've prayed over people, and it's consistently happening. If it's you, come on up. Come on up. God can use anyone. Amen? And you know what? I'll tell you this. He's sometimes going to use the least likely. Would you stretch out your hands? God, you are faithful. Would you say that? God, you are faithful. You are faithful to your church. You are faithful to those, the lost, who you want to call. And Lord, you want to empower your church. Lord, we believe you want to heal. We believe that you want to give Jesus and you want to give hope and you want to bring something forward that maybe hasn't been brought forward so much in a local church. And we ask you to do it here. We ask you to do it now. Lord, for those who are standing up here, we ask you that you would increase their gift, that you would help it make sense to them. Lord, that you would coach them, that they would be humble, that they would be in the word, that they would have compassion and mercy on them as well. And great faith, great, great faith. The Savior is at the center. And so, Jesus, we put you at the center. And we ask you to be here now in your precious name. Stay up here, you guys. The next thing is something that that I think we need more than what we respond to is prayer in our lives the things that we need. Because I know that people are walking away from this place on a Sunday, week after week after week, needing prayer, but maybe you're more hungry for food than you are hungry for healing. And you just want to get out of here. Maybe I I don't have to deal with this right now in this place, but if you're struggling with something, if you've got an ailment, let's get it prayed for. If you've got relationships that are broken, let's address them in prayer. Amen? A healed church is a testifying church. And so if we can experience healing, each one of us in the place that we need to have it, we can testify about it. And your testimony goes out to an unbelieving world that you can tell them, I know that God is real. I used to have this, but now I don't because God healed me. Do you believe that? We need our gifted healers, not to exalt them, but to heal the church and to draw people to Jesus. That is the reason for it. Amen? Amen. So let me ask you a question right now. How many of you need prayer this morning? Raise your hand. If you think, I'm I'm good, everything's good in my life. Guys, we need need prayer. We need to come for prayer. And we come to the body, we come to all of this, get prayer. Bring your kids for prayer. Find somebody up here that that you think, and then we have other people on, on our prayer team Make them available too right now. There are people who want to pray with you. Don't leave without prayer. This is the church. This is the church. This is the church. This is the power of God. This is the church. This is the body of Christ. Amen.